Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. My name is Annie Gibson, and I'm the publisher here at Playwrights Canada Press. I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual reading tonight, and thank you for joining us. I wish we could be doing this in person, but the positive side of doing an online event has allowed us to gather playwrights and translators from across the country, and even some who are outside the country right now, in the same space so we can introduce you to their new books. I'd first like to acknowledge that the playwrights and I are joining you from the traditional territories, some unceded of many nations, including those of the Inuit, Métis, and Wendat people, the members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, including the Ganyakahaga, the Anishinaabe, including most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the Cree, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, and Salto, who care for the land in Treaty 6 territory. We thank these peoples for their stewardship and their leadership, both past and present. Here in Toronto, or Takaranto, the place in the water where the trees are standing, where I, a settler, live, the original Indigenous caretakers of this place were party to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which asks everyone to take only what they need, leaving some for everyone else. With this in mind, I've made a donation today to the legal fund of 1492 Land Back Lane, a group of land defenders who are looking to stop a housing development project bordering the Six Nations Reserve. If you'd like to contribute as well, we'll post the link in the chat with more information. I am forever grateful for the opportunity to work, play, and share stories here on Turtle Island. We are also grateful for the funding we received from the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, the Department of Canadian Heritage, and Ontario Creates. Without their contributions, we wouldn't be able to bring you all of these wonderful books and host events like this one. I'd like to add a special mention for my fellow staff members, Blake Sproul, Jessica Lewis, and Ave Kathy Swaran, and our board of directors. I'd be lost without this team of people working together. A few housekeeping notes for tonight. We've turned on the chat feature on Zoom so you can send your praise to the playwrights. We encourage you to type in nice things about their readings. After each reading, we'll have time for a question or two. So if you have a burning question for any of our readers, now is the chance to ask. Either during each reading or shortly after, just type your questions in for that playwright or translator into the Q&A portal. Our host will also, excuse me, our host will read the questions aloud, so you'll be able to hear them and give the writers a chance to respond. We've also created a document with the excerpt text, so you can follow along while you, if you like. Uh, Jessica will also post the link to that in the chat, and we have closed captioning tonight provided by National Captioning Canada. And now I'd like to introduce you to our host for the evening, Karen Fricker. Karen is a Toronto-based theatre critic and educator. She is a critic at the Toronto Star and has written and broadcast for other outlets, including Variety, The Irish Champ Times, Arte A, and the CBC. She is an associate professor of dramatic arts at Brock University and the author of the book, The Original Stage Productions of Robert Lepage, Making Theatre Global, which was published by Manchester University Press in 2020. Karen is involved in a number of product projects around new approaches to theatre criticism, including Seeding the Future, a collaboration between CBC Arts, Obsidian Theatre and Brock and York Universities, Youth Theatre Ireland's Young Critics Program, and Taking on the Future, responses by emerging critics of colour to Soul Pepper Theatres around the world in 80 plays, which is being published on intermissionmagazine.ca. Karen, take it away. Thank you so much, Annie, and thank you to Playwrights Canada Press for, for the invitation to host this event this evening. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be able to uh, lead this event and introduce you to the amazing playwrights and translators whose work is being published by Playwrights Canada Press. I really enjoyed reading all of these plays in preparation for this evening, and I hope you enjoy these excerpts as much as I enjoyed reading the full plays. Please buy the plays and enjoy them. So our first, the way this is gonna work is that there are readings from four plays being read by their author and in some cases also their translator. So I'm gonna introduce them. They're gonna come on screen and read their brief excerpt. Then I'm gonna reappear and take questions from you, the, the viewers, which you'll be posting. Hopefully, please do in the chat function. I have some backup questions as well. There will be a little trivia around each play. Um, and the first person to answer the trivia question correctly will get a free copy of the play. Um, so, and it'll be a lot of fun and it'll last about an hour. So our first play is called The Law of Gravity by Olivier Sylvestre, translated by Bobby Theodore. 
Author and translator Olivier Silvestre holds a bachelor's degree in criminology and a diploma in playwriting. He has published, salut Olivier. Um, he has published two novels and two plays. Tonight's play, La Loi de la Gravité, has been translated into German, and Olivier is joining us from Germany tonight, and won the Artsena Creation Assistance Award in France and the Koberger Otto Ren Forum Award in Germany. Olivier also works as a writing instructor and dramaturg, and he lives in Montreal when he's not in Berlin. Berlin, Olivier, is that yeah, correct? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and I will also introduce your translator, Bobby Theodore, who is a Toronto-based screenwriter, playwright, dramaturg, and translator. How are you doing, Bobby? After graduating from the National Theatre School of Canada's playwriting section in 1998, Bobby was a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award in 2000 for his translation of 15 Seconds by Francois Archambault. Since then, Bobby has gone on to translate over 25 plays from French to English. His most recent translations include The Just by Albert Camus and tonight's play, The Law of Gravity by Olivier Sylvestre. So I will bow out at this point and leave the floor to you gentlemen to read a bit from your play. Thanks. Bonsoir. Um, hi, Bobby. Hi, Olivier. So this is my gonna... first. This is the first book launch I've ever had in 23 years. Oh wow! <laughs> it's about time. Yes, about time. 25 <laughs> plays have you translated? That's it's uh, it's uh, it's so much, and it's uh, what would I do without you? Um, and what would a lot of us do without you? So um, without further ado, we're going to uh, just read the first, um, uh, the first uh, lines of the play that, uh, that uh, sets the, the table for the whole play, I would say. And then we're going to read scene one um, of La Loi de la Gravité, The Law of Gravity, um, and uh, hope you enjoy. So here it goes. This is the story of Dom and Fred. And the famous letters, the big white letters on the hillside next to the bridge, towering like a monument. Garbage, empty beer cases, it's a perfect spot. The letters spell out the words, not the city. It's a pretty ugly spot. But there's something welcoming. It's a hiding place, a refuge of sorts. This is also the story of the cliff right beside the letters that plunges into the river and of the rows of houses, thousands of them just behind. And of the city right over there on the other side of the river and of the birds watching constantly from, off, from up above and of the bridge, a guard dog deciding who gets to cross or not. Dom and Fred, yeah, this is them. They're 14 years old. They're beautiful. So Bobby is going to read Dumb and I'm going to read Fred. One, the wrong side. Okay, so this is how it starts. This story. On the 3rd of September. Grade 9, 14, not 15, not yet. Here I am on the edge of the cliff with the big white letters you can see from far away, like big white teeth a beacon informing the world what's here over on this side, not the city. I'm new here. It's all lawns, pools, prefab houses, golden retrievers, muscle cars far as the eye can see. There's even a replica rocket that will never take off right in the middle of the highway. Help me, please. Birds are circling around me. Hey guys, knock it off. I'm not a French fry, okay? I look across the river at what's on the other side factories, promises, the city. I'd fly over there if I were like you. I'm hopeless. After we moved in, I log on looking for a friend. School's called Happy Hills. The name's enough to make you hurl. And just as I'm thinking that, hey, how's it going? Who are you? What do you want? I don't even know you. Uh, we just got here, me, my father, and my brother, Bruno. Uh, you in the 4E? Oh, God, you too? You're the first person I've talked to. I don't know anything about this place. Really? You want to be friends? I'm warning you. I never laugh. I have no friends. And I hate everything everyone else likes. Any questions? 
uh, several. First, where can you buy, can, where can you get decent shoes around here? Don't tell me someone with actual taste just moved to not the city. Second, where's the highest spot to look at the stars? Do you have a third? Uh, not yet, but it's coming. I tell them I know a place, the big letters, at the top of the cliff, close to the bridge, advertising our disaster of a non-city to the world. But I'm warning you, the path there is steep, dirty, and desperate, full of twists and turns, and totally muddy. You're going to scream and swear at the whole world. Sounds awesome. Yeah, well. Okay, sending you the location. Dom and Fran are now friends. See that pile of empties? Go until the busted tires, watch out for the dog shit, go past the dead oak, cross the ravine, follow the trail of used rubbers, climb the rocks, be careful, don't fall. I'm on my way. The same song playing in one ear on repeat, as loud as a jet engine. I'll be deaf by the time I'm 18. Everything's perfect. I look at the pictures on his profile. He seems all right. It's as if the cliff is tug tugging me along by the collar and I'm there. I check out the view. Wow. Hey, uh, looks like someone's spray, spray painting words on a, on a warehouse. They say you can do whatever you want in the city and no one cares. Really? That's what I heard. Dumb for Dominic? Fred for Frederick. Everyone's a comic. My first impression of Fred. His hair hides half his face and he looks like he's caught in his clothes. My first impression of Dom. He has a shaved head, arms crossed, looking like a killer. How's it going? Best day of my life. You? School starts tomorrow. I've had a stomach ache all day. We're trying it out here. This is our first, this is our fifth house since I've learned how to count. Uh, the cat's freaked out. It's hiding under the front steps. It used to hunt birds and bring us all sorts of crap. The cat stuff, you know. Uh, seems like everything's my fault somehow. Where are you from? Some hole called way too far from the city. No wonder you moved. It's a bit more complicated than that. Well, you wanted to see the view? You saw it. We look at each other, not sure what to do. I like your hat. It's a hat. Um, what are you up to now? I'm hungry, I'm cold, and I need to take a piss. Okay. That's about it. Well, so piss, there's trees everywhere here. Uh, I can wait until I get home. So that's how it starts. You'll see, we've got everything and not the city. The movie theater, the mall, the Dollarama, etc. Yeah, I noticed. He stares at me, eyes full of questions. You shaved your head? Did it this summer. Now the wind can't mess it up. And I tell myself, I think I just made a new friend. Oh, and don't go thinking we're friends now. Hmm. So we stay there, looking up at the stars. The city's on the other side of the bridge. The stars wink at me from above. You never know. Uh, I might just like it here. Well, you'd be the first. Thanks very much for that reading and for launching us into the world of your play, Olivier. Uh, can I Thank encourage uh, the viewers to, to pop any questions that you might have um, for, the, uh, for the playwright and translator into the chat? Um, I, have, I have a couple of questions to kick us off. Um, Olivier, what... What do you want teens to take away from this story? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I wanted to share with uh, with teens that and, and with everyone, actually, because a, a teen, a, teen, a play for teen is, isn't uh, it, 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 it's still good at, uh, at 18 years old and, and one day. So I think uh, I think it's good for everyone. But um, specifically for teens, I mean, I, I think I wanted to share with them the feeling that I had. Uh, growing up as um, not being um, not being a guy enough, so this this feeling of of not conforming to the uh, the assumptions of your gender or or what is uh, what is it, what is expected for you of, of you. So I wanted to to share that feeling and to and to put it into ca two characters that are at 
at not at the same level of questioning, but that question gender, uh, but also question uh, friendship and how to um, how to get along in school uh, with friends uh, with uh, um, uh, sexual orientation and and with you know with all all that's that's uh, growing in them uh, as they as they become teenagers. So I don't think there's a, a message there. So I, I don't like plays with message. So so, uh, but I think I wanted to share this um, this this universe, this feeling, and um, uh, yeah. So. Thanks, Olivier. I'm looking at the back of the beautiful published yeah. um, Playwrights Canada Press version, and there's a gorgeous quote on the back from Sarah Dion at Sead, who sa it says, she says, she wants to leave a copy of this play in every classroom, staff room, and bathroom of every high school in every city, not the city, and way too far from the city. So you talked about what you wanted teens to take away from it. Can you talk a little bit about what you might like adults to take away from the play? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the adults will recognize uh, maybe a part of them as, as, as they were as teens and also maybe, um, maybe have a dialogue with their, with their teenagers or, or maybe, um, um, yeah, uh, I, I may, mainly, I, I, write, I think I write place to set the table for a dialogue and, and to, um, to, to, to give an experience uh, and to, to unveil a world. Uh, and after that, you take that away and, and, and you think about it. And, and so, so, so the play lives more after, well, maybe not more, but at, at least uh, I hope it, play, it, it lives after uh, the show ends. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about diversity, but it's also, it's also about, uh, about difference and how, uh, how friendship or how, how people on, on our way can help us um, get along um, uh, obstacles. Um, um, yeah, maybe Bobby, you, <laughs> you don't hesitate to add to that. Um, well, I mean, you're the playwright, so you have to answer that question. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's you did bring up a very important point that it's it, most Quebecois plays don't want, don't teach. Uh, it's not part of the tradition to uh, to sort of carry to com to communicate a message that sort of a Victorian remnant that sticks behind. It's remaining in a lot of English Canadian plays. Um, not a bad thing, just a different culture. So yeah, uh, I think Olivier said it the best when he said he sets the table for dialogue. I think that that's often, and yeah, and that's what I have to say about that. Thanks, thanks both. And, and a final question for you. Um, this is a play in which gender identity comes to figure quite centrally. Are there other plays or other theater pieces that you've seen that you could recommend that that touch on these questions of gender identity that might be particularly relevant for teen audiences. I know that's putting you on the spot. Um, it, are there other are there shows that, that inspired you, Olivier, or do you feel like you're you're filling a gap that you think needs to be filled? Yeah, well, uh, when I wrote the the original uh, La Loi de la Gravité, it was 2013, so it was at the beginning. We were at the beginning of the, all, all of these issues and all of these questions. So so now maybe. I look like I'm I'm doing what a lot of people are doing, but but originally, because um, because um, my best friend is a trans man and and I've uh, accompanied him uh, all through the transition and all that, so so I, I I'm very close to to the subject even if I don't I, I haven't uh, experienced it myself. Um, but uh, to answer the question, uh, I mean two two plays that I've translated into French that I really love. So Wawati Fobister Zagokwe. Um, uh, um, it's published in a, in a collective uh, in English. Um, I think it's Playwrights Canada Press, but I'm not sure. And, uh, and the, the second play is Acha Bacha from uh, Bilal Baig. That is, from, that is published at uh, Playwrights Canada Press. So, so these, these uh, plays uh, are written from diverse uh, playwrights and, and bring uh, a very a different perspective around uh, to spirit and, and gender issues. And I think they're very uh, essential for the, um, for the topic. Great, thanks, Olivia. Do you have anything to add, Bobby? Are there other plays that treat gender identity that you think would be suitable for teens? Not that I, not that I, I, don't, get a, I don't get to see a lot of uh, TYA or teen plays. Uh, I hope that there are, uh, I feel like this play is, 
is great. Uh, the response from teens is great. So I hope that there are other plays out there. I, I imagine they're being written. Uh, I'm you know, almost positive, you know, judging from the uh, students uh, at National Theatre School who are exploring these issues as well. So I really hope so. I can't recommend any, but I, I, I think it's, it's uh, fabulous that the dialogue continues, especially at a young age. Yeah, thanks. And um, Annie has popped the, the two Playwrights Canada Press publications that you mentioned, Olivier, there. And of course, Bill Elbag is having a, a big moment right now because they're mm -hmm. in the CBC series exactly right. about gender fluidity. So it, so it seems like the, the English translation of this play has hit at a, real, at a really opportune moment to advance these conversations. Mm -hmm. So thank you both so much, Olivier and Bobby, for kicking us off. Um, and for your reading and for your generous response to those questions. So I'm Thanks, going Karen. to thank you and invite Kat Walsh onto our screen. Um, Kat is joining us from Edmonton this evening. How are you, Kat? Are you well? I'm good, thank you. Thanks, so I will, I will introduce you now. Your play is called Do This in Memory of Me. Kat Walsh is an award-winning performer and playwright based in Edmonton. And I should say that uniquely amongst the plays this evening, um, Kat's play is imminently to be published, but the Playwrights Canada Press volume is not available for brandishing, but folks will be able to buy it very, very soon. Um, Kat's plays include the site-specific Anxiety, produced by Theater Yes, the Gas Station Gothic, The Laws of Thermodynamics, produced by Theater Yes and Workshop West Playwrights Theater, and the Quantum Inspired Fetch produced by Interloper Theater. Kat is a graduate of the University of Ottawa. So Kat, um, I will leave the floor to you now to introduce your play and give us a reading. Great, thanks so much, Karen. Um, so this play is about uh, a 12 year old girl in 1963 in Montreal um, who wants desperately to be an altar server. Um, but at that time, girls weren't allowed to do that. Um, she prays for divine intervention, uh, but when one of her classmates goes missing, uh, she starts to worry that her prayers have been answered in the worst possible way. Uh, I'm going to read a scene from quite close to the beginning of the play. Um, Genevieve is in the church. Uh, she has just asked uh, her priest if she can be an altar server and was told unequivocally no. Um, she has gone out to pray about it. Dear Lord, thanks for all the help. Sorry, but come on. I don't wanna tell you what to do, but could you maybe appear to Father Paul in a vision or leave him a note? Or I'm sure you have better ideas. Or maybe I could perform a miracle. Just a small one, nothing too flashy, just something that would show everyone, but particularly Father Paul, that you're on my side about this. Maybe levitation? I'll let you decide. I will be done, amen. Uh, a young man appears behind her. He's about 14. He's dressed in something that suggests fourth century Rome. Um, he's got a halo. He is St. Pancras of Rome. And he says, Genevieve, Lord, Genevieve, you're here. Of course, you're everywhere, but I'm gonna go get Father Paul. Don't go anywhere. Behind you, she turns around. Oh, oh, yourself. Who are you? Ha <laughs> ha, very funny. No, who are you? Isn't it obvious? No. You don't recognize me from a stained glass window or maybe a prayer card. Um, I am Pancras of Rome. Who? Pancras of Rome. Saint Pancras of Rome, the patron saint of children. I thought Saint Nicholas was the patron saint of children. There are enough children in the world to have more than one patron. But since you've asked, I also look after jobs, health, cramps, false witnesses, headaches, and perjury. That's a lot of things. Thank you. 
are you a virgin martyr? We just say martyr. So you're not, well, aren't you nosy? In fact, I am, but with men, it's not necessary to specify. It's just implied. So how can I help you? I'm not sure. Well, you called for intercession, didn't you? I'm here to intercede with Father Paul, with God. Really? Really? Can't I just ask him directly? Sometimes you need someone to put in a good word for you. Besides, maybe I can even help you myself. I, yes. It's just that, yes, speak up. I want to be an altar server. And girls aren't allowed. Yes, and, and I want to change the rule. Oh, that's it? What do you mean that's it? Well, that's easy. It is, you can't. But you didn't even try. I'm going to give you a valuable piece of advice. Pick your battles. Just give up. What kind of advice is that? Do you know how I was martyred? I've never even heard of you. And it's so kind of you to keep reminding me. I was beheaded. You wanna see? No, fine. But it was because I refused to give up my faith. You know, my head, my actual head is underneath a basilica that's named after me. Really? Yes, really. You're not even a little impressed? Oh, I'm sure you have several basilicas named after you. It's not that. I am very popular in Europe. Maybe I should talk to someone else. You don't get to choose, and you don't get to change things to suit yourself. It's a silly rule, but still a rule. I want to ring the bells and, and carry the wine. Can't you just don't say, ladies auxiliary, become a nun? I'm 12, I'm 14, and look where I am. I don't think you're supposed to rub it in people's faces. And it doesn't have to be a change, just an exception. You think you're worthy of an exception? Yes, really, yes. Fine, I'll ask for an exception, but I can't guarantee what the answer will be. Thank you. Exceptions are very rare. When will you find out? I'll let you know when I hear. Should I wait here? You don't have to wait here. I can find you anywhere. Really? Trust me. I'll wait here. Go home to your father and brothers and wait for a sign. How will I know when it'll be a big one? Okay. Anything else? Do you know anything about missing people, missing children? My mother, oh, did she suffer from headaches? Uh, I don't think so. Hmm, you might wanna try St. Anthony of Padua. He's really the one to go to about anything missing, people, objects. Are you sure she's missing? She hasn't been home in a week. Definitely a case for St. Anthony. Pray to him. He gets results. Do you get results? Blessings of the Lord be upon you. Go home and wait for a sign. But, amen. Thanks so much, Kat, for that wonderful reading, which I think really gives us a flavor of, of the content of your play and also of, of the wonderful humor of your play as well. Um, so can I ask you, though, it's primarily about this 12-year-old Genevieve. It's intended, sorry, excuse me, it's intended for an adult audience. Can you explain a bit more about what you think adults can learn from Genevieve's story? I think that um, Genevieve is at that sort of time in your life that you're not quite finished being a kid, but you're not quite at the next step, right? And so she's still got the, the imagination and a sense of possibility 
um, which I think is something that as that adults can lose um, as they get older. They, the idea that anything could happen um, or just anything is possible, I suppose. Thanks. And I understand that this play has connections to your youth growing up in a Catholic family. Can you talk a bit about how your experience informed your character's experience? Yeah, I um, wanted myself desperately to be an altar server, um, but in my parish, girls weren't allowed to do it when I was at the age to do it. Um, I wanted to be an altar server for many of the same reasons I think that Genevieve does. So um, sort of an adult responsibility and, uh, and attention and importance. Um, and I was so frustrated that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do it. Um, and I thought about that when I, um, when I started writing the play um, and which is why I think I added, um, just that it in that time period when there were more restrictions, um, quite a lot of restrictions, uh, especially in, um, in society there. Um, to sort of up the frustration quotient. And so has it changed? Are, women, are female identifying people able to be altar servers now in Catholicism? They are. Um, I think my church changed. I think I was just like in grade seven or something. So I was too old to do it. But, um, but yes, I think for the, for the most part or probably almost all um, girls are allowed to be altar servers now. Totally interesting. I was raised in the Anglican tradition and I was the Anglican version of an altar server, oh. um, but it, there, there weren't gender restrictions on it, but it was, it made me feel very important. Um, <laughs> I, I love your stage directions, which folks will not have heard in this excerpt about how the audience can see inside the confessional booth or other like challenging things through the magic of theater. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how that has been staged or how you and what, what, is, what is some of the magic of theater that has been brought into a production of this play or what, what's your vision for that? Um, yeah, the, the stage direction about the magic of theater is always helpful when you're writing something that you're like, I don't know if anyone can do this, but <laughs> let's assume they can. Um, I've certainly, uh, we've had uh, in our production here, um, we had projections, we had, um, I believe, scrim, um, that becomes like transparent um, when you light it properly. Um, so just anything to partially transform it. I still want it to be like a confessional, but I also at the same time want it to be a, a spaceship or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I, I love collaborating with, um, with designers and, and hearing what their ideas are for um, some of the, the crazy things that I cook up. Yeah, that was one where I was, I, I would, I look forward to seeing a production of this play because there's so many things that you've, you've asked for magic to happen. Um, so I thank you, Kat. Um, I am going to return to your trivia question, but I realized I forgot to ask the trivia question for the first play. So let us cast our mind back to the law of gravity by Olivier translated by Bobby. And I have a trivia question and the first person to pop the correct answer into the chat will win a free copy of the play and Playwrights Canada Press will follow up with that person to get their address. So the question for the law of gravity is, what grade are Dom and Fred starting? Oh, oh, Sharon Dykstra, you got it right. So congratulations, Sharon. And you they will be contacting you probably through private chat to get your address, congratulations. So, let us cast our mind now back to Kat Walsh's Do This in Memory of Me. And the trivia question about this play is, how was St. Pancras martyred? What happened to that poor fella? Trudy Romanek, absolutely right. Oh, so many people were paying attention. Trudy got there first, fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Kat. Thanks, thanks for joining, thanks for reading and congratulations on this imminent publication. Thanks so much. Right. So now we are going to turn to the play Through the Bamboo by Andrea Mapili and Byron Avalos. So can I ask you, Andrea and Byron, to appear on, on screen together, being as you are a couple and parents. Thanks for joining tonight. I'm going to introduce you now. Um, Andrea is a playwright, movement director, choreographer, dancer, and somatic practitioner based in Toronto. In November 2017, she choreographed a production of Cassettes 100, a 100 person inter arts piece at the Young Center for the Performing Arts. In addition to co writing tonight's play Through the Bamboo, 
She was also movement director and assistant director for its 2019 Toronto Fringe Festival production. She is a graduate of the Tamalpa Institute and holds a BSc in biology from the University of Western Ontario. Byron is a Filipino Canadian playwright, actor and producer from Toronto. His play Remember Lolo won the Now Magazine Audience Choice Award at the 2005 Summer Works Festival. In 2011, Fujin Asian Canadian Theatre premiered his play Brown Balls at the Factory Studio Theatre. As part of the Sixth Man Collective, Byron co-created Monday Nights, an interactive basketball performance which is toured across Canada. Now Magazine named him one of Toronto's top 10 theatre artists of 2010. Byron has a BFA in theatre acting from Ryerson University and was an inaugural Bob Curry Fellow at Second City. So welcome to you, Andrea and Byron, and I will hand over to you to read from your play Through the Bamboo. Thank you so much, Karen, uh, and thank you so much to Playwrights Canada Press for having for this event tonight uh, and for supporting this play and helping us bring it into the world. Uh, so Through, Through the Bamboo is a big Philippinex Canadian story inspired by Philippine mythology about grieving and the importance of keeping memories alive through storytelling. And in our play, we follow our hero, 12-year-old Philly, who is mourning her Lola's or her grandmother's death. When she opens an old book her Lola used to read to her and finds herself magically whisked away into the fantastical land of Uwit, where she finds herself on an adventure to try to find her Lola and bring her home. And what we're about to read is a little bit from the prologue and then the first two scenes. It moves rather quickly. And we'll both be playing multiple characters. So good luck. Good luck to us. <laughs> <laughs> prologue, the past. Lola, with her malong, weaves a story. There is a place, a place of islands and crystal blue waters, where steep, silvery, jagged cliffs plunge into the sea, where the forest roots are filled with wisdom and branches carry stories to every shore, where the warm air smells of sweet mangoes and the creatures and humans live in harmony, basking together in the golden light. This, this is, is the, the land, land of, of a week. week. Scene one, the present. The basement of Lola's house, full of boxes filled with knickknacks, odds and ends, and a lifetime of memories. Family friends and mom are sorting through the boxes. Philly enters holding a lampshade. Don't touch that, put that back! Philly, go back upstairs. No, they're all crazy. They keep taking all our stuff and putting it in boxes. The family friends exit. Your Lola's friends are just- Nothing that's supposed to go together is going in the same box. Your Lola's friends are just trying to help us sort through her things. I tried to tell them that the green lampshade only went with the tall light because that's the- Forget it. I'm keeping the lampshade. I know you're upset. I'm fine. I'm upset too. Lola's death has been- Maybe it's better this way. She was sick for a long time. She didn't remember us anymore. I don't want to talk about it. Now that she's dead, she's- I said peace. I don't want to talk about it. She's gone, I get it. Okay. When you're ready, you can come back upstairs. Mom exits and heads, heads back upstairs. They're even taking the pictures out of the picture frames, you know? Philly starts looking around at all the random things in the basement. She finds a box marked for Philly and takes out a kubing. Weird, I mean. Thanks, Lola. Philly pulls a book from the box. Through the bamboo, the book you used to read to me. The wind breathes through the pages. A malong falls out. She puts the book down, picks up the malong, and puts it on. Suddenly, Philly hears Lola's voice singing, Sa Ugoy Nang Duyan. Sanay di ming magmaliw ang dati kung Lola? Philly looks around trying to find where the singing is coming from. She looks at the book and goes to it. Philly shuts the book and the singing is muffled. As the song comes to an end, Philly opens the book and the singing intensifies as Philly is transported into its pages. Scene two, a forest. The air is humid and filled with electricity. Philly opens her eyes to find she is surrounded by Ipokita and Geeting. Ah! Ah! Nolly! <laughs> it's you! It's really you! Where'd you? How'd you do that? Begin the barrio fiesta! 
Ibakita and Gating dance like light while playing kubings. Hundreds of impish duende flood the forest, scurrying, giggling, and leaping. Yay! She's back, she's back now. From her fall, her stories, they will save us all. Oh, this isn't happening. I'm not in a forest. I'm just in Lola's basement. I'm going to close my eyes, count to three, and then everything will be back to normal. One, two, three. Yay! They begin to chant and dance the Maglalatik. Isa, Daloa, Tatlo, Nale! Philly is caught in the middle and tries to escape multiple times to no avail. Oh, what's, oh, what are you? Yay! Oh. She's back, she's back. Now from her fall, her stories, oh. they will save us all. Excuse me, I'm lost. Can you help me find my way home? Yay! She's back, she's back. Now from her fall, her stories, they will Tell save us all. Are. It doesn't matter who we are. It's who you are that's important. Yay! She's back, she's back now from her back. Uh-huh. We knew you were back because the sky, it's turning gold again. And now we found you. Welcome back to Uwe. What's Uwe? What's Uwe? It has been a long time since you've been home. <laughs> Tell me who you are. I'm Ipakita of the Duende. Sure, so she's Tita Pita. Ipakita. And your name is? My name. My name, I am Geeting, protector of the Duende, the fightiest, mightiest, tiniest. Who are you calling tiny? I'll show you tiny. Geeting takes out her Arnie sticks and shows off her skills. <laughs> the Duende, ooh, and ah, and her moves. Ipagita jumps in to stop her. Ah, that won't be necessary, Geeting. Remember, she's here to end the reign of the sisters. Yay, she's back, she's back now from her. Stop, get down. Eating grabs Philly and pushes her to the ground, hiding her. The Duende all hide, and Ekek flies overhead. Ekek! What was that? Quiet! And Ekek, the courier for the sisters, and the rise over a wit. What? Shh! If there's an Ekek, that means the ground rumbles. Down! Eating grabs Philly and pulls her into a Duende mound, concealing her from sight. A Tikbalan battalion led by General T enters. Keep your eyes open and sniff for human flesh. General T and the Tikbalang Battalion search, finding nothing. They exit. Clear. What was that? Tikbalang, demon horses. And the army of the sisters. That's the third group of Tikbalang and Ekek that's passed through since sunrise. You're lucky we found you first. All of Uwe has been looking for you. I'm getting out of here. Keep your voice down. They'll kill you if they catch you. Why would anyone want to kill me? You're the key. The key to what? Freeing the creatures of Uwe. Freeing your home. <laughs> Look, I don't know you, and this place isn't my home. Okay, I just gotta find... Uh, I'm out of here. Philly goes off in search of the way home. She's gonna get herself caught. Everyone, stay hidden. She's our responsibility, and we're not gonna let anything happen to her. Let's go. We can't mess this up. They exit after Philly. Thanks, that was amazing. So many characters <laughs> and so much so much energy and fun. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, how do you feel? How do you feel? You, you did it. <laughs> uh, it's fun. This is how we kind of like wrote a lot of the plays. Like read, oh shoot. Oh my gosh. Whoa. I think they might've turned off their computer by mistake. Oh my goodness. Um, maybe perhaps while we wait for um, Andrea and Byron to come back, I can check in and make sure that Mary Claude and Alexis are here. Are you able to turn on your cameras, folks? Mary Claude, hello, nice to see you. Sorry, this is a little bit sooner than we expected. Hi, fine. How are you? I'm well, how are you? Good. And there's Alexis. Hello. So um, it looked like our previous readers, it looks like in their enthusiasm, they might have knocked their computer oh, yeah. off the desk. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. So why don't we get started with you two? And then we'll, we'll work our way through your reading. And then we'll return to, to Byron and Andrea for questions afterwards. So thank, thanks for being on the spot here, folks. Byron, hello. Did you, did you turn off your computer by mistake? 
So, uh, you know, the thing with a kid is that sometimes you can't quite do everything. So we <laughs> forgot to plug in the computer and it just died. Apologies. Okay. So Mary Claude and Alexis, could I ask you to, to step back for a second? I'll finish off with uh, Byron and, and Andrea, and then I'll come back to you. Um, so Byron and, and, and Andrea, can I ask you, speaking of kids, your play is uniquely meant for kids and grandparents to experience together. So can you tell us some of the reactions that audiences have, have had to your play? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I can remember uh, an, early, an early reaction, a little boy who was four years old, uh, sitting next to actually Byron's Lola. And they're, you know, related, they're related. So they know each other very well. And he was in, in awe of what was going on, all the different characters. And every once in a while, Lola would reach down and go, are you understanding? <laughs> Let me tell you what that Tagalog or that Filipino meant. And she, you know, so we, we found that the audiences were like quite lively, you know, and it was uh, quite interactive and it, it kind of did what we were hoping to do. It, would, it sort of started dialogue between um, these two different generations. And what we were hoping for is for people who, who have grandparents who are still alive and still with them to like leave and want to be curious about their lives and want to go home and ask them questions. And we have feedback uh, right after the play, people like kind of weeping and going, I'm going to call my grandma now. <laughs> You know, just interested in the lives that they led that were outside of them being their grandparent. Thanks. And can you tell me a little about how the play was inspired by a book that you received as a child, Andrea, and how you wanted to create your own mythology through the play? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this, the original story is called Manik Wangsi and it's a folktale from uh, one of the islands in the Philippines. And I was given this book when I was a kid and I remember when, Byron and I started talking about this play. We just, we had this book and, and Byron really wanted to write a play for his nieces and nephews to see themselves on stage. And we found this book and we just thought, well, what, I wonder what happened when uh, the main character or Tuan Put Lee, this princess of the sky, as she was trying to ascend into the sky, she actually fell off the horse. And we were wondering what if when she fell off the horse, she landed in, I don't know, Toronto or in Canada. Like what would it have looked like? And that was sort of the, 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 mo the inception of uh, what we then created. But well, we can talk a little bit about like, yeah. the actual. I, I, for us, for yeah, uh, for us it was really important. It's really important to say that this is like a Filipinx Canadian story. So this, the myth we use in the story isn't how you would hear it in its truest form back in the Philippines. We took elements of it and, and we kind of, uh, use our imaginations and because for us the protagonist is this Filipina Canadian uh, so we'll have grown up with kind of western traditions of story ta uh, st uh, fairy tales and stories but also hearing these stories of creatures back home from mythology so we want really wanted to create a tale that wove those both together because that kind of reflects who we are in our intersections as both Filipinos and uh, Canadians as well. Thanks. Thanks so much for those answers. And, and I can say I saw the Fringe production and it was so exciting to see it because I saw it, 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 there was so much word of mouth and by the end it was just packed. And it really seemed like you reached your audience, like you, you, the community came out. So is, is it important to you to reach Filipinx Canadian audiences specifically with this work? Yeah, absolutely. As Andrea said, you know, I, I have uh, nieces and nephews. We now have a daughter. And at the time uh, of that production, Andrea was eight months pregnant and doing like movement choreography and things. So it was like our art baby and our real baby coming into the world at the same time. So it was a very magical moment. Uh, and earlier on in one of the developmental readings we had, someone after the reading said, you know, uh, I grew up reading stories like Chronicles of Narnia. And I, I always wish that I came from a culture that had stories like that. So mm. we wanted to put something out there that showed like Filipinx kids that, yeah, we have stories that are big and fantastical and magical and that can have just like a large epic scope as well. So, yeah. Thank you so much for your answer. So now it's time for the trivia question. Everybody get your, get your hands on your keyboards here. This first one is tough, but we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> what are the couriers for the sisters called? 
<laughs> nice try, uh, Liz. Not but that one. Yeah, it's that one. <laughs> the other one? Yeah. The couriers for the sisters. The, the, the flying ones came. That's fine. Uh, 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 how about a clue? Uh, can I give a clue, Karen? Yeah, of course you can. Okay, this is the sound it makes. Ack, 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 ack. <laughs> Earl, ack, yes! the clue. there you go. Well done, Earl. Yeah. You got it right. Awesome. Okay, thank you both so much for your, for your reading and your responses. Have a lovely evening. And I will ask Mary Claude and Alexis to return to the screen. Um, bye, you guys. So this is, this is going to be our last of the four readings. We're gonna run a little bit over our, our seven o'clock time, but I hope everybody can hang with us. Welcome back, Mary Claude. And, and here's Alexis, fantastic. So the play that you are gonna be reading from is called Andy's Gone. It's written by Marie Claude Vergier and tr translated by Alexis Simon, you're both very welcome. So I'm gonna introduce both of you now. Uh, Marie Claude Vergier's first play, Jeanne Sweet, I'm gonna get the French right, Jeanne Sweet was produced at the National Arts Center's French Theater. Her play, Nous Autres Antipodes, received an honorable mention by the Prix Gratien Gélena from the Centre des Etoiles Dramatique. In 2018, Marie Claude became the first playwright in residence at the Bibliothèque et Archive National de Québec. She is currently working on a sci fi play, Seeker, which Alexis Diamond has been commissioned to translate for the Bushwhacked Theatre Collective. Great name. Marie Claude is also a dramaturg and has worked with many distinguished directors. She lives in Laval. Alexis Diamond is the theater artist, opera, opera and musical librettist, translator and theater curator, working on both sides of Montreal's linguistic divide. In 2018, Alexis began a collaboration with Aaron Hurley and Emma Tibaldo, researching the history of English language theater in Quebec. Alexis is the Anglo-Canadian theater curator for the Festival de Jamais Lu. She presented the mostly fr French language Faux Amis with co-author Hubert Limer for the festival in 2019 and has continued to work on it with Hubert at the 2021 BAMP Playwrights Lab. She lives in Montreal. So you're both very welcome. And I am going to give the floor to you now to give us a reading from your play, Andy's Gone. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Oh, so um, I'm just gonna give a little bit of context first. Um, so Andy's Gone was a uh, commission by French company Allegro and Sempre, and uh, it was about uh, doing a contemporary retelling of Antigone, uh, especially the Jean Louis version. So um, the play is set in an unnamed city uh, during a, a huge storm, and it's happening. Uh, everyone has been ordered by the Queen Regina, which I'll be playing, um, to go inside. Um, however, we hear noises that uh, Alison, who's the Antigone character, uh, has been roaming outside and she has now uh, returned and this is our confrontation uh, at the beginning, um, scene, this is uh, scene three. It's hella dark in here. Didn't you hear the edict? Why the circus? I was worried. This is what, a chapel for Henry? What else are you going to conjure? You ought to have been at the cemetery this morning with us. I couldn't. Too busy living the active life of a princess? I'm not a princess. Oh, but you are, your father was king. Not anymore. You're still a member of the family. You must always remember that. What family? We used to be close. When I was 12 and had my hair in pigtails. What's changed? I got older. Oh, because you're so old now and wise to be. What's all this can't be for him? It's for us, our grief. Because at his burial, we're what's important, of course. Appearances are all you care about. You ought to have been here. You had to have been there this morning. For you. For the family. You make it sound like we're the mafia. I demand to know where you were. You're not my mother. 
I am the leader. I was at the cemetery farther in. Why didn't you join us? You weren't at the right grave. Are you saying that we missed the one with the honor guard, the flag, photograph, and flowers? That wasn't Henry's grave. It wasn't Andy's grave. You'll stop this Andy nonsense. I have one son and he's called Henry. Henry the Valiant, the fucking knight, the king of the city. What's your language? Henry was a brilliant boy. A real little star, or maybe a comet whose brilliance flamed out over our heads. I'm not brilliant. I live in shadow. Little Miss Sirius. And it was in the dark that I saw Andy appear. You lie. You've got more than one son. That's absurd. You're rewriting history. No, it's the same story, the same boy. I know his heart, but you're fixed on his face to save no. yours. You will not take that tone with me. Never. You will stop being impertinent and playing the wild child. You will toe the line. You will do what Henry did. He would have been a true king, and now all the city has left is you. Be worthy. I'll never be like Henry. I'll never be like you. I'll never be queen. Andy knew it. He refused to follow you. He refused to follow your orders. He disobeyed. Andy knew, and that's why he's dead. How dare you? My son Henry never refused an order. He was, he was an exemplary soldier. You dishonor his memory. This is blasphemy. He died this, mo this morning. You have no right. Finally, I thought nothing could shake you anymore. I will not allow you to tarnish his memory. Straight ahead in the cemetery. Straight ahead of us. All for show, like magic. Then, like in all good magic shows, something disappears. Allison. But that's all right. I know where he is. Henry is buried in the cemetery under the flags. Not anymore. What did you do? I reworked your design. It wasn't right. To make everyone believe that Henry's in the cemetery when we both know it's all smoke and mirrors. Silence. Do not listen to her. She is delirious. It is the grief. It's a phase. What did Henry die of? That is confidential. No more make-believe? It's a state secret. Whoa, I'm scared. You should be. You should shut up and listen. You should do what we tell you to do. You have a future. Do not destroy it. I am your future. Since Henry is gone, you will succeed him. I'm not one day. I'm now. Now you're nothing but a child. You know nothing. Everything lies before you. Be thankful for that. I don't give a shit about your future. I want the truth right now. I want Andy. Calm down. It'll be over soon. We'll go back home. You'll go back to playing in your room, playing with your toys. You'll return to school. Everything will be as it was. I won't forget him. Honoring his memory does you honor. That's what I want to do. He was the one who told me. He was the one who opened my eyes. To what? What's behind the walls? No. Andy told me everything, revealed it all. Since yesterday, I see. Since yesterday, I'm no longer a child. I'll never be a child again. Yesterday, the world was wild and magnificent. Today, it's terrible. Yesterday I was playing Assassin's Creed. I was flying rooftop to rooftop. I was killing bad guys in my flying suit. Very late. Too late. A text. Meet me. I have to show you something. Andy. So I go, like always. I go to his window. I wait. Crap, where are you? No answer. A stick figure doodled on the wall, winking at me. An arrow. His tag. A game? You've got to be fucking kidding me. He made me a game. I look around. I see his tag. I follow him like Thumbelina. I jump. I climb. I fly. Under the stars, I'm like the princess of Persia, moving through the gray night of cats and bats. The arrows guide me. 
I laugh. It's a game, our game. I get to the end of the road, the end of the world. Our city stops at the walls. Like a medieval map, those who keep going fall off. It's an abyss. I catch my breath. Nothing. The arrows have disappeared. No trace of Andy. I don't text him. I'll find him. No clues. I've got my pride. Drawn by the emptiness, I approach. And I see. And I understand why my father plucked out his eyes. You made that up. Thanks so much for that reading. Big revelation there at the end. Um, made me want to keep on listening. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, Marie-Claude, I wanted to ask you, this place was this piece was commissioned in France and you wanted to use it as a way to get teens and adults in conversation about issues facing immigrants there. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, well, uh, when the, the theater came with the idea, they had very specific parameters that they wanted us to use. Um, the company is based in Montpellier, which is a medieval, medieval city. And we uh, rehearsed in a small town close to the Corbusier, which is run by the Front National. So it has uh, very right-wing views, um, but also the play is made to be uh, performed in classes. So it's really made to be played everywhere. And there are, they have audio, uh, head, they have headphones and they can take them off. And it's for a lot of students, it would be the first time that they actually went to a play. So um, you might hear my, my daughter. <laughs> um, so it's the first time they go to a play. So the idea was to engage and I wanted to make an Antigone whose sacrifice was not about herself and her brother's burial, which is a tradition, but about something altruistic. And so our Antigone is um, going against the idea of the walled city. And it was a time where a lot of migrants are still and still are um, coming to Europe. And they were always talking about so closing the borders and they were building walls around uh, Eastern Europe and even France. So the idea was to engage students with something happening really on their doorstep. Thank you. And um, it's really interesting to, to hear an Antigone that's a reimagining of that play really zeroed in on these two characters because these these are the the two the two speakers yeah. are are the characters. So can can you talk about the the experience of honing the conflict of the play down to to the, um, to the relationship and the conflict between these two women. Yeah, well, also we wanted to have uh, two women. Um, so uh, usually it's Creole and he's a male character, he's usually older. And we really wanted to turn this around and have uh, two women and one slightly older. And the idea is that they, they could mirror each other, that Regina could have been Antigone at one, Alison at one time, and that, that they were both what could have happened to each other. Um, had things been different. So there, there was really wanting to take the idea of male and power out of it and really focus on the, the relationship there. And um, the idea was also yeah, to strip the bare bones and that there would be no uh, emo and no uh, sister and, and really uh, make it all about the two actresses also, which makes it really a, a, an intense proposition, but really draws in the teenage audiences because they actually walk amongst them. Students are not um, in, uh, seated somewhere and the actors are uh, in front of them. It's actually weaved through it. So they actually walk amongst them and they're seated on the floor. And there's this whole, um, uh, it's very engaging uh, for, for the audiences. And also to see uh, two, two female characters really um, battling out together about wits and about uh, uh, rhetorics in politics. Thanks. I have, a, I have a super specific translator question, Alexis, uh -oh. which is, um, what does it's hella, what was it's hella dark in here in French? Oh my god, <laughs> I don't remember. Marie-Claude, do you uh, remember? <laughs> it's, uh, c'est noir comme chez le loup. Yeah. Um, it's so a very specific. Uh, it's like an untranslatable. <laughs> <laughs> it's untranslatable. So Marie-Claude and I spent a lot of time talking about uh, Alison's character and sort of the tone to take. And so 
there's the, the this level of language and um, when, when Regina is very formal, there's no contractions in her grammar and and um, and so Allison has more like contractions and more slang and it's more, you know, so we were trying to create that like that Allison's informal and Regina's quite formal until she kind of gets emotional and then it sort of breaks her, her facade breaks. Well, th that line definitely jumped out at me. It's like just super contemporary English parlance. And so, it, and then it was the first line that you read. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna ask that question. Um, thank you so much. And now it's time for your final trivia question. Um, what video game was Allison playing the night before? Liz Walsh gets it right. Assassin's Creed. Well done, Liz. You will um, you'll be contacted by Playwrights Canada Press to get your free copy of Andy's Gone. It'll look just like this one. So thank you so much, Mary Claude and Alexis. And can I ask the rest of the of the writers if they're still awake? Olivier's it's past midnight in Germany. Um, Andrea and Byron, welcome back. Olivier, you made it. Congratulations. Yes. I don't run out of boats, so I'm here. <laughs> and and Kat's still here. So it, I'm I'm inviting everyone back on screen to to thank you again for for generously being here and reading for reading from your plays, and most of all to congratulate you on on the achievement of publication. It's such an important thing to have plays available to be read, to be taught. To I I teach a lot of new Canadian plays, and I I love Playwrights Canada Press for bringing us so many plays that are just hot off the stages um, into our own hands. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the audience for, uh, for your attention and for your cool answers to the questions and congratulations to those of you who won the trivia. So that we'll close it here. Thanks everyone for being here and have a lovely evening. Bye. Thank you.